Welcome to my combination vacation footage guide and review for Big Sky Skiing as it existed in January 2022. Uh, I spent four days there with my parents and in that time tried to get a feel for as much of the mountain as I could. I'm no professional, but I am persistent and can get down things up to double black difficulty even when stupidly holding a selfie stick. So this review is from that perspective. The resort itself is only just over an hour away from the Bozeman Yellowstone Airport. That airport is small, but very high quality. Unsurprisingly, they went for a lodge aesthetic. Uh, must be a lot of tourist money moving into the area over the years. The drive is tame compared to what you might be used to getting to mountains in Colorado, for example. Uh, relatively little elevation change, no scary tunnels. Uh, if you don't want a rental, the Karst Stage Company runs buses nearly every hour, and I grabbed one on my way up for $65 one way. One of the draws of the ski area itself is its size. Currently tied for longest combined slope length uh, in North America with Park City at about 155 miles of trails. Interestingly, despite this, it only comes in third or fourth, apparently Powder Mountain is controversial, uh, in skiable acreage. Big Sky's 5,850 compares to the over 7,000 at Park City and over 8,000 at Whistler Blackcomb. Uh, I don't intend to do a whole thorough analysis of why this is, but my initial take is that it has to do with the types of terrain offered by the resorts. Big Sky spans the entire spectrum from beginner runs to what they designate as triple black diamonds. Uh, runs with, quote, exposure to uncontrollable falls along a steep, continuous pitch Root complexity and high consequence terrain, end quote. Uh, in some cases, think Buzz Lightyear, you know, falling with style. And as they're graced with the picturesque Lone Mountain and its jagged outcroppings, they have a lot of these runs. Uh, on a few sides, basically every chute you could fall down on the lip up there is a named triple black. I think this inflates their trail count and slope length with minimal skiable acreage added, but don't get me wrong, I think the vast array of types of runs on offer is a positive of this resort, something for literally every ability level, plus they're cool to look at. The other thing the Triple Blacks do is make the trail map kind of intimidating looking. Most of the runs at the resort are on the northern side, so the main map looks at that face, but don't forget there are two supplemental map inserts for other views. Uh, in particular, the main view makes it seem like only people capable of doing those triple blacks can get anywhere near the summit when that's not true, uh, but more on that later. On their trail status page, they divide the resort into five areas, so I will too. The first is the Andesite and Spirit Mountains, served by the Ram Charger Lift as one of the two primary main base lifts. Uh, it's quick, fits eight people per chair, has heated seats, a weather protection bubble, and rarely any line in my experience. Yeah, it's supplemented by the Thunder Wolf and Southern Comfort chairs as respectable standard high-speed quads. This trio of chairs gets you to everything from greens to double blacks. And while I would do it all, my preference with most people uh, tends to be toward big, long, open, groomed blues and blacks where you can really feel like you're carving swooping turns while staying in control. Uh, and when it's sunny, the best run for that over here is Elk Park Ridge, followed by Bighorn, uh, both leading to the Thunder Wolf lift. Bighorn is bigger and pretty amazing, but Elk Park Ridge gets much better light and is harder to find, so has fewer people on it. Just go slow at the end as we found it slippery. Runners up runs are all the blue ones under Ram Charger. They're shorter and are very popular, so tend to get skied off, but this is the place to be as the day ends. Uh, these runs keep the direct sun better than anywhere else at the resort that I found. In particular, Tippy's Tumble is a nice balance between snow quality and light, as is Africa. That run is short, but is in glorious sunlight right up until the end. Spirit Mountain is nearly all greens and was mostly closed when I was there, so I'm kind of discounting it. And Flatiron Mountain, served by the Lone Moose Chair, is both punishing to get to via a long, flat catwalk, punishing to ride via a super slow lift, and generally not worth it, in my opinion. Um, the only thing about that is that because of all the punishment, no one is there. So it had some of the most plentiful piles of snow on Bobcat when I went down that. Overall, Andesite Mountain is my pick for best section of the resort when I was there due to the light, accessibility, and runs offered. Up to me. 
have here? Uh, okay, famous last words. Okay. That was fun. The second area of the resort is what they call Lone Mountain East. This is the core of Big Sky, it's right in the middle. Uh, it's served first by the other main lift from the Mountain Village, uh, Swift Current. That lift was just upgraded this season to match Ram Charger's technology. Though Swift only fits six people per chair and generally had the largest lines, those lines were never more than a couple minutes for me at least. Uh, it's a really impressive lift. Unfortunately, while the trails under it seem like they should at least equal the blues from Andesite, I felt they were slightly worse. Uh, Lobo and Calamity Jane were the best, but felt a little narrower and less likely to be in the sun, while Crazy Horse is in a valley, and I don't think I ever saw it lit up. I did enjoy some of the blacks, though, like this stump farm run. There are two other major lifts in this area. Uh, Challenger is a normal speed triple serving only expert terrain that I went off a few times. Um, the highway run up there gets some of the first sun of the day as a single black diamond and is a good choice if there's snow. And the Powder Seeker chair sits in the main bowl below Lone Peak. Uh, it serves the Lone Peak tram to get to the very top as well as a smattering of blues and blacks. If you get fresh snow, I bet this place is nice, but I mostly found it to be both crowded and often shaded. Overall, I found myself mostly using the swift chair of Lone Mountain East as a way to get to other areas of the mountain rather than spending a lot of my time here. The third area is Lone Mountain North, uh, maybe the most interesting to discuss of the bunch. It's big, really big. It takes three lift rides and most of an hour from the mountain village to even get to the plethora of blues and blacks over in this area. Consequently, it felt more empty and out in the wilderness, which is quite nice. 
Uh, our first time out there, we hit Lookout Ridge while it was like perfect in the sun and freshly groomed. It was amazing. But the area is really held back by its lift. Iron Horse and Lone Tree are slow, really slow. Um, while Six Shooter is technically a high speed quad, but so long that it's still like a 10 minute ride. Plus you're then required to take Lone Tree after Six Shooter to access most of the runs. The side of the mountain makes sun fleeting and Six Shooter is in a valley uh, such that on one of our days it was extremely cold and windy when everywhere else was fine. I wanted to like this area a lot, but it has many pros and cons to consider. Uh, Whiskey was a fun tree run I particularly liked. The fourth area of the mountain is Lone Mountain South. Uh, unfortunately, the Dakota lift was closed due to lack of snow, so I can't discuss that much, but as it can only be accessed either from the summit or via a long string of lifts and catwalks from somewhere else, and it contains only expert runs, I expect it would be nearly pristine wilderness when open and a great place to be. The other lift in this area, Shedhorn, was open but had limited runs. Uh, my favorite part about Lone Mountain South and probably why it had the least snow is that it's the area most directly facing the sun. That and it had very few people. Um, also note the small Shedhorn Grill in this area is the only spot to get food actually up on the mountain. I was surprised that the real eateries were only located at the base. That's abnormal in my experience. Though at least the options were more than just burgers and pizza. For example, I enjoyed the Poke Bowl that I got one day. Ooh, food. Overall, there wasn't enough snow to do this area justice, so the runs were mostly a game of dodging rocks, but I think under normal circumstances, it would be one of the better areas. Rocks. Yuck. Oh, uh, my poor skis. The last area of the resort is Lone Peak itself, uh, exclusively accessed via a special tram. Unfortunately, that tram does cost extra on top of the normal lift ticket. Um, I'm a little bitter on this point, honestly. It's some kind of variable formula how much it is per day. Just assume if it's a day that you'd actually want to go, it's gonna be on the more expensive side. 50 bucks when I went. That area consists of all the hardest stuff you access from the tippy top. Uh, a bunch of triple black diamonds that require ski patrol babysitting, but also some single and double blacks. Most of it was closed due to lack of snow when I was there, but that didn't stop the view from being awesome. 
All right, we're at the top, Lone Mountain. And I walk out on what seems to be an open floored little viewing platform. Love it. I ended up going down the Liberty Bowl off the south side. The top of that run was very difficult as rocks were extremely prevalent in the snow, but things evened out after a bit and it turned into a challenging but impressive long black run with the snow from my own turns falling down around me as I went. Oh, my poor skis. See all this rocks? I like how my own personal little avalanche is following me. Oh, look, a rock. Hello. Watch out, dude. My overall impression of Big Sky was very positive. It's an easy drive from the airport, but far from major cities, so it remains less crowded. Though if nightlife is your thing, it's lacking in that department. Uh, there's bountiful terrain of every level to ski. Yellowstone National Park is nearby if you want to mix things up for part of your trip. And I'm a sucker for that picturesque lone peak in the background to really define a ski area. That's something most of the Summit County Colorado mountains lack. I think it's worth the visit and worth considering seriously in my quest to find the places I'd go repeatedly in the future. If this kind of video is helpful or interesting to you, let me know uh, and I'll make more of them on my upcoming trips. Thanks for watching.